Uh, thank you, Darius, for your introduction, and thank you to Philip for the wonderful, uh, for, for the invitation, and also for the wonderful hospitality, uh, which I'm very much enjoying um, on my first visit to Poland. So, um, in the first passage that is on your handout, uh, Anchises famously compares the uh, imperial conquests of Augustus uh, to those of Hercules and Bacchus. The obvious meaning of the comparison is that Augustus will traverse and civilize uh, even greater territories than Hercules and Bacchus, uh, both cultural heroes who impose order upon savagery uh, and both figures for global uh, conquest. In an influential article from 1899, uh, Edward Norden uh, illuminated these lines against a background of panegyric uh, on Alexander. Even though these texts don't survive, uh, they may be reconstructed from the references to them uh, that we do have in rhetorical sources, such as uh, Menander Retor. The connection between Dionysus and Alexander uh, may be traced back to either to Alexander's own lifetime, as some scholars think, or to uh, the first generation uh, after the death of Alexander. I'm interested in probing what work this reference to Dionysus is doing uh, for Anchises and for Virgil at this point uh, of the Aeneid, and also what broader function and alignment of Dionysus and Augustus uh, could have. The inquiry is made uh, much more interesting uh, by the material that uh, Philip has just been talking about, uh, namely the uh, self-styled identification uh, of Mark Antony uh, with uh, Dionysus. Some scholars have argued hard uh, that Augustus managed not only to neutralize Antony's connection uh, with Dionysus and the word divestment uh, is frequently used uh, in that context, but also to create a link between himself uh, and Dionysus. Uh, other scholars are resistant uh, to this view. Uh, a strong argument against it is that Augustus did not restore the temple of Ceres Liber and Libera on the Aventine, which, which was destroyed by fire in the same year as the Battle of Actium. Uh, its restoration was not completed until the reign of Tiberius. So this means that Augustus left it uh, in a state of disrepair during his entire uh, reign. Um, despite this, scholars have built a case on the basis of numismatics, uh, wall painting, and poetry, particularly the poetry of Horace, for some kind of reintegration of Dionysus uh, into the Augustan regime. And my efforts fall into uh, that category. My main argument will be that the lines under number one on the handout fall short of positing an identification between Augustus and Dionysus, but that they allude to the possibility of such an identification, particularly against the historical background of Alexander Imitatio. Um, I think that there are, so, so, so really the work that I'm doing here is I'm trying to establish uh, how um, Dionysus becomes a figure that confers charisma on Augustus as leader. And I believe that there are two bases to this, both of which are concerned with power of increase. And actually, um, I, I was very interested in the discussion earlier about the relationship between ideas about Dionysus and the political uses of Dionysus in actual history rather than in philosophical uh, discourse. And I think that um, I'd like to certainly use your uh, argument about uh, Dionysus as a figure for harmony and reconciliation uh, after the very traumatic divisions uh, of the decades of civil war uh, that Augustus um, comes to power uh, after. But the two points really are uh, power of increase uh, in two spheres. The first sphere is empire, and the second sphere is vegetation. And both of these can be substantiated separately, but they're sometimes connected. So as god of uh, vegetation, uh, Dionysus can make things grow, particularly the crops, but also animal life and human life. 
uh, but also he makes the empire uh, grow. Now, I want to say a few words uh, about method. This paper is part of a larger project, uh, which will be about interpreting Virgil's references to Dionysus um, throughout his entire corpus. And really, one thing I'd like to do is to try and reconstruct what kind of Dionysus uh, Virgil had within his view. And that raises the methodological question of whether indeed it is possible to do that. Um, the most captivating and persuasive studies uh, of Dionysus, uh, at least since Nietzsche, and we could think here of uh, Walter Otto's book, uh, Karl Kerenyi's book, uh, Dodds's book, Rode's book, they often look for uh, a core essence of the god, or a series of core essences. And when we think of Dionysus in Virgil, we have to realize that all instances of Dionysus in the ancient world are actually very historically contingent, including our own. And we also have to take into consideration that Dionysus has been reconstructed uh, in a very wide variety of ways. So to take a quotation from number five on the handout from Park McGinty's book, uh, he says that interpretations of Dionysus reveal more about scholarly presuppositions than uh, almost any other issue in classical studies. Um, and there's a new book published in Madrid recently that uh, takes a similar idea by uh, Diego Marino Sanchez uh, called uh, Injertando a Dioniso las Interpretaciones del Dios de Nuestros Días a la, uh, a la ant Antigüedad, uh, with further documentation along, along similar lines, uh, except including antiquity as well as um, modernity. Now, a second problem concerns the question of comparanda. Uh, essentially, if you try and interpret Dionysus in Virgil on the basis of comparative evidence, uh, you have to make a selection about what evidence you think is important. And that may involve arbitrariness, or it may involve uh, different kinds of uh, circular thinking, because of course by selecting some evidence you're excluding others, and how do you decide what to include? Uh, you could take your cue from Virgil, so the danger of circularity is that uh, Virgil suggests certain comparative sources, we go to these comparative sources, we extract a construction of Dionysus from these comparative sources, and then we feed that back into uh, Dionysus, so that uh, back into the interpretation. So that is one possibility. Um, another kind of circularity, and one which I'm very willing to be guilty of, is to use earlier parts or, or to use different parts of Virgil's work and different versions of Dionysus in Virgil's work to interpret other versions of Dionysus in uh, Virgil's work. So I refer here to uh, uh, an often cited quotation by Don Fowler, number six on the handout. Um, it is simply common sense to me, for instance, that we construct our own readings of antiquity. I don't see how anyone could deny this. It sure ain't the Klingons or the Archangel Gabriel who do it for us. But in my word, construct, of course, is a whole postmodernist agenda. I'm trying to con people into buying. So Fowler stages a polarized debate here uh, between um, enfants terribles uh, radicals and traditional historicizing uh, philologists on the other hand. Now, this debate is actually quite reminiscent of the arguments between Nietzsche and Wilamowitz and others that surrounded the publication uh, of uh, the birth of tragedy. And modern classical scholarship lives with the legacy of this highly relevant debate, such that when we study Dionysus today, uh, we may spark creative fire from the tension between ancient and modern, traditional and radical approaches uh, to the study uh, of the god. The most important thing, I suppose, is to be transparent about what assumptions uh, underpin uh, the inquiry, uh, transparent and explicit. So across, uh, Virgil will have been quite aware that even in antiquity, uh, Dionysus was understood in a wide variety of ways. So we have the Orphic Dionysus, who's a child of Persephone. We have the, uh, the more traditional Dionysus, who's a child of Semele. We have ex uh, expressions in Cicero and Diodorus and, and elsewhere of the multiplicity of Dionysoi, uh, which are um, available. Uh, 
Accordingly, across Virgil's corpus, Virgil does, uh, across Virgil's corpus Dionysus appears in different guises at different times. And I suppose the engine of interpretative meaning in my study, if I can use that term, is the interplay and the contrast. I won't necessarily say contradiction because I might incur the ire of Richard Seyfried, uh, but the interplay and um, perhaps sometimes even the contradiction between different versions of Dionysus uh, that Virgil draws on in different parts. So sometimes he symbolizes uh, civilization, sometimes he coheres with the sacro idyllic bucolic landscape. Uh, sometimes he's connected with fertility, poetic inspiration, sometimes tragic madness, or a combination of tragic madness and political evil. And he frequently interacts with other divinities, whether Juno, uh, Hercules, uh, Apollo. Here in Anchises' speech, and I think perhaps here alone, uh, he is connected with the idea of victory, victoriousness. Um, so, um, with these various considerations in mind, I'd like to now return to our passage number one, and I'm going to read uh, Nobel laureate Seamus Heaney's posthumously published translation. This is he whose coming you've heard foretold so often, Augustus Caesar, child of the Divine One, who will establish in Latium, in Saturn's old domain, a second golden age. He will advance his empire beyond the Garamants and the Indians to lands unseen beneath our constellations, beyond the sun's path through the zodiac, away where a sky-braced Atlas pivots on his shoulder the firmament inlaid with <coughs> glittering stars. Already the Caspian kingdoms and Meotia know of his coming and begin to tremble at the oracles of their gods. The waters of the Nile quail in alarm and roil through their seven mouths. Not even Hercules pr pursued his labors over so much of Earth's surface. Not when he stalked and shot the bronze-toed deer, silenced the boar in the woods of Arimanthus, and left the air of Lerna vibrating to his bowstring. Not Bacchus either, careering in triumph, the vine reins in his grip, driving his tiger team down the heights of Nysa. The emphasis here is on how Augustus will restore the Saturnian Golden Age in Italy and expand the empire. And in line 792, we have the name Augustus, and this is closely followed in 17, 795 by Proferet uh, Imperium. Now, etymologically minded scholars, uh, of whom many work on Virgil, have posited connections between Proferet Imperium and Augustus based on the etymological origins of Augustus from Augeo, Augere, which points to power of increase and also has religious references through Augur. And next we get the references to Hercules and Bacchus. Um, I'm mostly going to leave Hercules to one side uh, for this paper. Uh, except to say that uh, in uh, my Gazzata's paper from this morning, where we had the conjunction of Hercules and Bacchus, it may well be that one of the most important intertexts for um, Hercules and Bacchus on the Severan coinage is not simply the Thracian tradition, but also actually specifically this passage of Virgil. They're found conjoined actually as early as book 14 of the Iliad uh, in the Dias Apate, where uh, when he's being seduced by Hera, um, in a very elegant chiastic uh, arrangement, um, Zeus mentions Semele and, and Alcmene and their offspring, uh, Hercules and Zeus, uh, 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 Hercules and Dionysus. Dionysus referred there as Charma Brotoisin, uh, a joy to mankind. And there are various other parallels that we could uh, adduce for the Hercules Bacchus uh, connection. So, as early as um, Charma Brotoisin, the idea of Dionysus as being connected with fertility uh, is quite strong. So let me just see which one do I push and which direction do I aim it in. Um, thank you, thank you, thank, thank you very much. Yeah, wonderful. It works slowly. All right, okay, yes, yes, yes. It needs human intervention. I see, right, okay, yeah, good, good. I'll point it at your head then. Um, so there are various, there are various um, texts that we could point to to substantiate the uh, connection, very much on the level of ideas, but also on ritual, and we'll come on to that in a moment, between Dionysus and vegetal fertility. 
Uh, we have it in the Homeric Hymn, the seventh Homeric Hymn, where Dionysus makes vine tendrils grow over the ship. Uh, we have it in the Bacchae, where Dionysus makes milk and honey uh, come out of the earth. Uh, we have it in certain of Dionysus's cult titles, such as uh, Endendros and Dendrites and titles like that. Uh, we have it in the presence of Yakos uh, at the Eleusinian Mysteries to the extent that we reconstruct them as an agrarian cult. Uh, we have it in the Athenian Phalophoria at the Great Dionysia. And not only do we have it implicitly, but we have it explicitly uh, in certain passages, including this bit of Plutarch from his essay on Isis and Osiris, um, where he talks about how he was the Lord uh, not a, the, ma the Lord and Master not only of wine, but of every sort of moisture. And he gives a quotation from Pindar, where we have the verb auxanoi uh, to exemplify uh, Dionysus's uh, power of increase. Uh, the Romans, too, uh, hailed Dionysus as a god of fertility. Uh, there is debate among historians of archaic Italy whether a version of Bacchus predated um, the arrival of Dionysus on Italian soil, but certainly by the 490s BC, when the temple of Ceres Liber and Libera uh, was dedicated uh, in Rome, the fertility connection was quite strong because this, was, this temple was vowed during uh, a grain shortage that imperiled uh, the military might of Rome. Um, and we have a very interesting piece of evidence from Varro, um, I think this is on the slide. Um, yes, thank you. So this, this is Varro via St. Augustine, uh, where we have a phalophoria. And um, this is basically a description of uh, a, 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 an in honestum membrum, a, a, an image of the phallus uh, being carried around on wagons uh, all around Italian towns and villages. And to crown it all, uh, a mater familias, a matrona, uh, needs to put a corona on top of this phallus. As, uh, and of course, August, Augustine is extremely censorious about this, as if this was the height of ignominy. Um, but he does explain it. So we have an interesting mixture here of uh, ritual and discursive commentary uh, on ritual, which we don't often get. Uh, but he says at the end of the passage that uh, this was so that the fascinatio, so that the hex, as it were, be warded off uh, from the crops that Dionysus uh, might be propitiated. Elsewhere, um, and this is on your handout, number nine, uh, Augustine tells us that they had put um, uh, Dionysus in charge of liquid seeds, and there's a dis discussion about how uh, Dionysus, Liber was in charge of the male seed and Libera was in charge of the female seed. So that's very charming indeed. So it's quite close to what we have in uh, Plutarch. Um, it's not surprising that we have associations between Dionysus and fertility elsewhere in, um, in, in, in Virgil's poetry. And I won't go into it in great detail, but the metaphorics of Dionysus and of Eleusis, of Eleusinian cult, are quite strong uh, in their associations with fertility in the uh, Georgics. And I'd like to test out on you an example of this in number 10 on the handout. We have here one of the songs uh, from the ninth eclogue. And um, in Dryden's translation, why Daphnis dost thou search in old records to know the seasons when the stars arise? See, Caesar's lamp is lighted in the skies, the star whose rays the blushing grapes adorn, and swell the kindly ripening ears of corn. Under this influence, graft the tender shoot, thy children's children shall enjoy the fruit. So we have quite an insistent emphasis here on how Caesar will preside over the crops. But Caesar is referred to as Dionian. And I'm very tempted to think of, to hear an aural echo of Dionysus in Dionian, even though it refers to Venus through um, Aphrodite, the child of Dione. Anyway, you can take that or leave it. My argument doesn't depend on it, but I'd be curious to know what you think. Um, whatever about the Eclogues passage, I do think that the idea of Dionysus' as fertility god is activated in this passage from Book 6 at the beginning uh, of the handout, particularly in relation to the restoration of the Golden Age and the idea that the ruler must take responsibility for providing food for the people. So there's a very sort of Malthusian reality 
uh, I think, uh, behind this. And this is the status that Augustus has in the Georgics, where in the prologue, when his divinization is envisaged, he is hailed as Octorem frugum, as well as uh, tempestatumque uh, potentum. Now that's the first part. The second part is uh, the various references that are to do with Dionysus as a god of conquest. And really the earliest evidence for this are the materials that Professor Isler Karenyi was, was, was putting before us and discussing this morning uh, of Dionysus as gigantomach. Uh, but there are two other, I suppose we might call them um, strands. Uh, we have the idea of um, Dionysus as conqueror of the East, particularly India, and also the phenomenon of Dionysus imitatio, uh, which we get from Alexander onwards. The tradition, and we have a good example, I mean, you know, we don't have to reach back to the sixth century and uh, classical vase painting to get the idea of um, Dionysus's gigantomach in number 12 on the handout. We have this in Horace, present in, um, in Virgil's literary culture. Uh, the idea of Dionysus's conqueror may go back as far as uh, Euripides' Bacchae, this, uh, at least the prologue to the Bacchae is the earliest example that we have, lines 14 to 17, even though at least one German uh, editor of an analytic temperament uh, wished to obelize those lines on the grounds that they represented a Hellenistic uh, understanding of geography. This is Albrecht Diele, uh, but various people uh, don't agree with him. Uh, Alexander certainly is the first historical figure for whom it is attested that he identified himself uh, as um, Dionysus, and w there, there are basically three main areas of connection between uh, Alexander and Dionysus. And the interesting thing about them is that they're not all favorable. Dionysus is an unstable symbol, even in the mythologies, the legends of Alexander. So there is the story of the Carmanian revels where um, Alexander was like Dionysus in his triumph, and there's the whole idea of conquest itself. Uh, then there's the, uh, the coming upon Mount Meros, this ivy-covered mountain, which is full of fertility, where they supposedly meet uh, descendants of the original col colony or plantation that Dionysus put there however many years ago. And then thirdly, we have uh, the murder of Clytus, and various sources tell us that Dionysus, uh, that because Alexander neglected to pour libations to Dionysus uh, on this occasion, uh, that Dionysus maddened him and that the drunken killing of Clytus was a retribution for uh, the hubris of neglect. Um, leaving aside this complexity, uh, when Dionysus is taken up in Rome, um, there's quite a tradition. Oh yes, this is another example of fertility, the uh, Dionysian imagery being connected with fertility that we get in the Arapacus. Uh, next, please. Uh, when the tradition is taken up in Rome, uh, we have various Roman generals who um, identify themselves in one way or another uh, with Dionysus. And we, 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 some, some people say that it was a response to Mithridates, king of Pontus, and this is a very large dossier. But certainly Marius, Pompey, as well as Mark Antony, possibly Julius Caesar, possibly Lucullus. And the sources, the rhetoric of the sources, which gives us this information, is interesting because often it is censorious. The idea being that Antony was doing a bad thing in um, associating himself with Dionysus. And quite often the sources make the connection with Alexander uh, explicit, as for example, this, uh, th these, these, these references from Pliny um, on um, Pompey's African triumph. So it isn't an incidental um, association with Dionysus. It's one that plugs into the tradition of Alexander imitatio, of which there are many other manifestations, including certain kinds of hairstyle and uh, various uh, other things. Now, um, next slide, please. There were various things about Antony's Dionys Dionysian persona that probably garnered him favor, especially in the East, but it also got him into trouble, and we have a lot of evidence for this. Uh, we already have it in uh, Plutarch in chapter 24, uh, where we're told that, and I think this might be the next slide actually, uh, we're told that he, um, you know, he, he, the, the, the different cult titles come into play, that we have sort of beneficent and savage cult titles uh, for uh, Plutarch. 
Uh, and then, would you mind going back to the other one, please? Uh, there are various references in Dio, where on, this, for example, is Antony speaking to his troops uh, before the Battle of Actium, where he rouses his troops against Antony by uh, criticizing how he has gone native. So Dionysus is, if you like, a symbol that, uh, uh, that Antony finds difficult uh, to control. And again, there's more that could be said about that, but I think one of the key words here is counter-propaganda. I don't know if that word has been used yet today, but I'd like to maybe add that to the mix. And I'm sure that counter-propaganda is part of what was behind the uh, chapter 75 of the God Abandoning Antony. Okay, and may I uh, have the next uh, the one after that, please? Yeah, next one as well, yeah. Okay, so um, I'm going to conclude with some numismatic evidence. Uh, and some of the most interesting evidence for uh, building a case uh, for the connection between Dionysus and Augustus is indeed numismatic. So when Antony was in the East um, in the uh, late 40s and 30s, uh, he, he, he minted these Eastern coin types, Kistophoroi. They're a Dionysian coin type to the extent that they have the Kista Mystica and also the snakes. So that's a famous example of, Di of Antony with the Dionysian coin. And later, if you move to the next slide, please, we get a uh, an Augustus Kistophor, where we have exactly the same thing, only we have Augustus instead of Antony, and we have some laurel added to the ivy. So laurel is one of the plants of Apollo. So it's not that Dionysus has been replaced by Apollo. That would be far too Nietzschean and far too binary and schematic. But what we have had is we have had an integration, which goes part of the way towards uh, a reappropriation or a, a recuperation uh, of some kind. Okay, next slide, please. And then in 19 BC, at around the time that um, Augustus, through diplomatic channels, managed to get back the Parthian standards, which had been lost by Crassus at the battle after which his head was used as a stage prop for Pentheus, um, there was a series of coins minted to celebrate the return of the Parthian standards, uh, minted by a certain moneyer called Turpilianus, and they had Dionysus on them. So just if you look at these three, where we have Augusto uh, Obkives Servatos, uh, and then obviously the name of the moneyer, but obviously a very clear Dionysus. Uh, this one here, we have a kneeling Parthian. Uh, <coughs> we know that he's Parthian because he's wearing trousers, uh, yielding up, as it were, in a gesture of submission, uh, the standards. And we have um, Signis Receptis. And then the next one, please, uh, is very similar. That, that's actually the one with Signis uh, Receptis, Kaiser, Ob Kives, uh, Servatus. So we can, I think, bring these things into the mix to argue for uh, a connection between uh, Dionysus and all these backgrounds in our passage in Aeneid 6. So, so to conclude, um, often when people think about Dionysus in Virgil, they think of a negative kind of Dionysian uh, manifestation. Um, the madness of Dido, the madness of Amata, uh, the civic evil, the anti-Augustan uh, tones, if you like, that these represent. Um, but leaning on traditions, historical traditions, Hellenistic traditions, and the connection of the stewardship of the food supply, uh, we can also interpret some of the references to Dionysus in Virgil favorably, uh, pro-imperially, etc., etc. Um, but the, the, the danger is that we never know what kind of Dionysus we're going to get. And the symbol is uh, multivalent in meaning. And therefore, the negative ones can reflect on the positive ones or compromise the positive ones and vice versa. Uh, already in Euripides' Bacchae, uh, the god styles himself with a dualistic formulation as uh, Theos de Notatos Anthropoisi de Piotatos, uh, a god most terrible uh, but to mortals uh, most mild. Um, certainly looking forward to the kind of thing that we might get at the end uh, of Euripides' Bacchae. And my conclusion really is that I think Dionysus appealed to Virgil uh, owing to the complexity uh, of his symbolism, and in particular this idea that we don't know which version uh, we're going to get, the good one or the bad one, or, or something in between. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's an extremely interesting uh, speech, and uh, uh, which doesn't help us to understand, uh, in fact, uh, what means Dionysian in under uh, pen of uh, Virgil. Uh, but 
help us to understand that it's a useful tool, isn't it, uh, to, 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 to de define different situations, but not a very simple um, uh, feature. That's, that's surprising. Uh, I'm opening a discussion. Yes, please. Yes, thanks. Uh, and what we have then is a, a dialysis that was already very complex. And indeed, it does involve contradiction. And we have a Dionysus who is already very complex and does indeed involve contradictions, which is, which is then uh, brought into a historical period in which enemies are both uh, are, are wanting to claim as anybody would, the patronage of the god. Uh, I mean, nobody could be simply anti-Dionysus. And this sets up then this highly complex series of reactions. Um, and, and what we get is what you might expect, actually. I mean, so that if, um, if Antony is a problem for Augustus in his association with Dionysus, I mean, that's because you, Augustus can't simply be Nobody can be simply anti-Dionysus. You can't be anti a great god, even though that god has been appropriated by your enemy. So other strategies are involved, and they may not be even explicitly formulated. They will just emerge. Um, that, now, to be sure, that passage in Plutarch where he's called both, both mild and very cruel, is it agriotitos or, or... Yes, I mean, that, that has a, a long history, that word, actually, for, for Dionysus. And that there's even a Theban festival, the Agrionia, which is a... Um, and, 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 but this is a sort of fascinating point, because you quoted that bit of the Bacchae, where he is both terrible and, and mild. And um, it looks as if the bit of Plutarch may be influenced by that, or influenced by that tradition. Actually, you, did, you, you slightly misquoted it because I think you left out the word entele. Actually, <laughs> because that's, that's very... Uh, I, I wondered whether you'd pick up on that. That's very... I mean, I, I don't blame yeah. you for leaving it out yeah, yeah, because, yeah. because people generally think they don't know what it means. <laughs> so, so, but it, it, it is an absolutely crucial <laughs> yes. uh, um, uh, line of the backy. Yes. And it's been, it's been prized by so many people as somehow bringing us to the heart of the god. So you have the god who is um, entele de notatos, anthropoisi de apiototos, right? So what does entele mean? In authority, the most terrible, to hu uh, but to human beings in general, most mild. And that doesn't make any sense at all. Um, my interpretation is actually very simple and in my view, actually makes perfect sense of entele. It's the only one that does. Telos can mean an initiation ritual, right? And it, it, telos, it, there are examples of it. Telos means an initiation. It can mean many other things as well, but it means an initiation ritual. And Dionysus, of course, is denotatos entele. He's denotatos in the initiation ritual because that's secret. It's all this, this terrible stuff that he does are the sufferings of the initiate in the, in, the, in the negative phase of initiation, the sufferings of death, dismemberment, and so on. And moreover, that makes perfect sense of entele. Moreover, of course, it is antithetical to anthropoisy, because anthropoisy means to people in general, the uninitiated, the initiated, everybody. So I've no doubt that that's what that, that, that phrase means. And of course, what you find then that just as it's, it's taken by certain people to be a kind of contradiction out of context, just, just a contradiction, it can be used politically then by the enemies of Antony, that idea to, as it were, make sense of the fact that he has this relationship with the god, which is very difficult for his opponents to handle. I would have thought that the, the most effective way of doing it is precisely what you get in Plutarch, uh, with the passage Philip talked about, in which you say, well, actually, the god left Antony. Now, I don't know whether I haven't read the literature on that passage, but to me, the whole point of it is not the sort of Cavafian pathos that you get, <laughs> but, and, which is our instinctive reaction to it. It's such a poetic scene. But what, how, do you do with, how do you deal with the fact that this 
this terrible man, Antony, has this close relationship with Dionysus. You say, well, there was a point at which the god decided to leave him, that god was fed up with him, and so he goes off to the camp of Augustus instead. It looks to me just like political propaganda in origin. I don't mean in Plutarch, but I mean in origin. Because as far as I know, and I'm not an ancient historian, the Greeks and Romans didn't go about trying to, trying to tempt the gods of the other side to join them. They did do that in Mesopotamia. For example, if you, if you laid siege to a city, you'd spend much of your time trying to get the gods of the city to leave, come out from the city through the gates and join you. You know, that was a, that was, that happened in Mesopotamia. So far as I know, and I might be completely wrong about this, it didn't, that sort of thing didn't happen so much. I don't remember it in Thuc well, Thucydides probably wouldn't comment on it anyway, but Herodotus and, and Polybius and so on. So it's not a particularly Greco-Roman thing to do. It's more an ancient Near Eastern thing to do. But of course, there may be examples. But, but in this situation, it's done not so that you win the Battle of Actium. It's done so you deal with, you handle the association of Antony with, with Dionysus. Um, there is the Roman tradition of evocatio. Yes, yes. Um, okay, yeah. And, 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 and then also, um, I, I'm, I'm not sure whether that word has been used in, this, in the literature on this passage. Um, it may have been, but it should be. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's not, of course, it's not itself an evocatio, but it shows, yeah, you're no, right. No, I mean, but it, it, could, it, it, could, it could reflect the tradition of the evocatio. But the, the other interesting thing about that passage is it's leaving Alexandria. It's not actually before, but it's, it's, it's actually after Antony has lost the Battle of Actium. So you could argue that yes. it's because Antony is such a loser that the god has abandoned him. Um, incidentally, there's also a Leonard Cohen song. Uh, you were talking about the Cavafian pathos. There's a Leonard Cohen song, Alexandra Leaving, which is a breakup song, uh, which puts a completely different spin on um, leaving yeah, Alexandria. Yeah, so in many ways, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, the fact that it's after the battle kind of yeah. dissociates it from the, the yeah. mindset of Evocatio, doesn't yes, it? Yes. There's something else going on, which I think is the propaganda. Yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Filip Deruszewski. So, Fiakra, Fiakra, I'm sorry, you, you told us that we are not sure what <laughs> Dionysus is in, in Virgil. But what, what do you think about those scholars who say that a very important intertext for Aeneid is actually the Baki? I mean, that at least the first part of, of Virgil's Aeneid follows the narrative of, of the Baki, meaning that Aeneas is a sort of of Dionysiac agent. I mean, he, mm -hmm. he, yes. he comes yes. and he is rejected and he fights and yes. he triumphs and so yes. on and so yes. on. Yes. Yeah. Um, I think that I agree with, and indeed I have agreed in, in print with, that view of reading the Aeneid. And interestingly, you can see it linking up with other aspects of the Aeneid that are not particularly Dionysian, uh, tragic intertextuality more broadly. I suppose that I'm not trying to say that any one interpretation is wrong, although if I thought something was wrong, I would say so. Rather, that I think that different strategies and manifestations of Dionysus can coexist. So I don't think the existence of the Dionysus one, uh, of, of, of Euripides' Bacchae as, as a sort of a literary background uh, for the Aeneid necessarily rules out any of the others. In fact, if, any, in fact, if anything, it makes them more likely. Uh, but just going back to what I was saying earlier in response to Richard Seaford's paper, um, if you read the second half of the Aeneid as a kind of Bacchae, you can read Amata as a kind of Agawa figure, Turnus as a kind of Pentheus figure, and indeed even the name Turnus, again to the etymologist, has suggested Tyrannos, and Aeneas as a Dionysian figure. And it is possible to read the uh, sacrificial killing of, um, the pervertedly sacrificial killing of uh, of Turnus at the end of the Aeneid, where Aeneas uses the word imolat, and even his greatest supporters are a little bit cagey about his use of the word imolat there because it's it, the sacrificial language doesn't belong, or the proxy is not being observed more broadly. But we can read this against the uh, sacrificial killing of Pentheus. 
And then that gets us into this debate about um, how should the killing of Pentheus make us feel versus how should the killing of, uh, of, of, um, of Turnus make us feel. And it, it really goes back to the discussion that we were having earlier about whether the end of the Bacchae is celebratory or not, or whether the end of the Aeneid is celebratory or not. Do we have here the triumphant, the triumphant victory of the Trojans over the Italians, or do we instead have something you know, more complex that may involve that, but that might also involve um, a generous perspective on the uh, the pathos of the loser, and I think this is something that we have in in the back eye as well. That even if you think that on balance, uh, that Dionysus needs to win, and that um, it's great that we now are going to have communal festivities and the establishment of the rites and the festival, it's very hard to erase uh, the pain of the death of Pentheus, and that's one of the that's probably why, that's one of the reasons we're still reading the play because it has this complexity in it that that is appealing to sensibilities throughout the ages. So I think that the um, e even the Euripidean intertextuality in the Aeneid is something that can be read in at least two ways. Although 25 minutes, it's still not tragedy. Uh, we are late 25 minutes. If you would like to ask a question, Please, last question now uh, for Fiacra. Uh, if not, thank you very much again. <laughs>